food, it's a big problem in the monetary system, since it could be obtained only with money, those invented papers, people cannot live without it, and the monetary system owns all. If you do not believe me, give up the monetary system, take a bow and arrow, and start hunting for food, in the place where you are. It's very possible to be arrested by police because you broke the rules of the monetary system, although, the earth and its resources cannot be owned. Also, it is very possible not to find any animals, all being detained by the monetary system itself. For food, for their rarity, for zoo, or for various reasons. Also, you cannot find any fruit or any vegetable, because all have been privatized. You can test yourself that, food, is not available outside the monetary system. And if you want to build a house, with a farm, to create your own conditions, food, electricity, you have to buy land and materials from the monetary system, and then, pay various taxes. The food is also the main weapon, that, created slavery. Once you have food control, you can manipulate beings who need it. The food is a problem in the monetary system because it comes along with other products, that are considered commodities. Is food a commodity? Analyze a little bit the human being, and deduct if food is a commodity. No wonder that the monetary system transformed food into an event. Romantic dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, all holidays are actually food. Many people die, daily, from lack of food or because of poor food quality. Also, many accept the monetary system because otherwise could not get it. Drinkable water? was abundant a few years ago, and nobody had any reason to sell it, that until was transformed into a business. This situation is so ridiculous, as one, in which, the air, would cost. I think Jacques, uh, you mentioned a statistic that I, was about water scarcity, how we're, we were on pace to running out of water, I, I, was that a statistic that you had? I couldn't remember. While well, there's floods going on all over the country, how can you have a water shortage? <laughs> what we have to do is harness the flood waters. Right. If people live near a giant waterfall with lots of water, nobody steals water. Nobody packages the air in front of you and takes it home with them. There's so much of it, there's just no need to steal it. What we have to do is produce an abundance, make it available to most people. Crime is based on scarcity, most crimes. There are, the answers are really very simple, they're not sure. complicated. What is complicated is the educational system today, which is false. If we dump stuff into the ocean, toxic materials, and we pollute the air, we are not civilized. As long as we have prisons and military solutions, you know, military people are sincere, they really want to defend the country, but they don't know how armaments, airplanes, the machine guns, all that is crude and vulgar, the same as a caveman. They're not much different. How about if, instead of millions of dishes, would be produced just a few, but enough for everyone? What would you think about food abundance? What about supermarkets that are always filled with food, but only those who have money can buy it? What about foods that expire and are thrown away? This, when thousands of people die of hunger every day. What about the tons of food wasted every day? What about animal food? You can produce for people, instead of animals. Because, after all, the monetary system is for who? Not for the humans? How about if there would be bread with vitamins in it for those who die of hunger and abundance of them?
wenn ich ihnen sage, ja, dass die Tonne Weizen jetzt 100 Euro kostet. Ja. Und wenn ich heute schaue, ja, was der Streusprit kostet ja, und was das Salz kostet, was man auf die Straßen stehen, was man im Winterdienst verwenden, ja, dann fällt die Realität. Heute kostet der Streusprit mehr als der Weizen, denn was der Bauer produziert. Und das müssen die Leute wissen. Das müssen die Leute wissen. Es wird einen gerechten Preis geben für die Produkte, die wir produzieren. Und nicht nur immer sagen, ja, die Schnitzel darf nur 2 Euro kosten. Und dann wundern sich alle Leute, ja, warum wir Tierfabriken haben mit 20.000 Schweinen. Das ist die Frage, ob wir das wollen. Ja. Aber anscheinend wollen sie bald. Weil das wird immer schlimmer. Also wir fehlen im Jahr ungefähr 2 Millionen Kilo Brot weg. Das, was aber gar nicht schlecht ist, ja, das, was das ist höchstens zwei Tage alt. Das könnte halt noch jeder essen. Und das, und das passiert mir heute immer noch, obwohl ich das Geschäft jetzt da schon mehr als zehn Jahre mache und immer dieselbe Strecken fahre, dass alle Leute stehen bleiben und das Ganze einfach anschauen, was sie es nicht glauben können, was wir da machen. Welcome back to Good Morning Northwest HD. Well, it's said that on average a family will throw away about one third of all the food that they purchase. KXLY 4's Colleen O'Brien is here with a cool click, one that'll show you how to turn expiring food into a meal. That's right. Yeah, if you're like me, I'd hate to waste food, but inevitably I will throw away that almost rotten group of vegetables and it pains me. I hate throwing away food. But this website, lovefoodhatewaste.com, it'll show you how to turn anything from stale bread to dried out mushrooms and bottom of the cereal bag crumbs into an actual meal. So let me show you the first waste saving tip they have on this website. And it's something I struggle with, that's portions. And it's right here in the, the red tab. And all you have to do is choose from the most popular foods here that people have problems with portions. I'm gonna choose pasta because I always either cook too much or too little. Nothing wrong with leftovers, but when you cook too little, that's a little disappointing. So here, I'm usually cooking for two adults, no children, but you can also choose for children. Next step, you need about 200 grams of pasta. Another helpful tip is that with rice, they use uh, hand-filled portions or half-mug portions, so really easy to understand. Uh, another one is the meal planner. Save time and money. They make a list for you right here, a two-week meal planner. Well, all you have to do is print out the shopping list shop for it and your meals are already planned so you're not going to waste any food you're not going to buy too much or too little that's a great thing now coming up in the next half hour i'm going to show you the best part of this website and that is all you have to do if you have something about to expire or a food that's just getting to that point where it's a little bit limp the veggies you know what i'm talking about choose from this list it'll show you how to make a meal out of that almost expired Food. And there's actually a way to use the crumbs at the bottom of the cereal box, Colleen. <laughs> yeah, this is for the people who hate wasting food so much that they lick their plates. Oh. It, it's true. <laughs> you can use the bottom of the crumbs in the cereal bag, put it into a bread mixture and take out the equal amount of flour and it actually adds texture to your bread. That's according to this website. So you can put your favorite cereal into your bread. Yum. Sounds good to me. So what I wanted to explore this half hour is you have some food expiring, you have some veggies that are going limp, what do you do with them? You don't want to waste them. Well, this will show you a recipe to use all of your expired items. So it does the work for you because recipe books don't always, uh, you know, categorize things by expiring food. So this takes all the guessing out of it. Let's explore it here. All you have to do is go to this blue tab called recipes. We'll wait for it to get there. And then at the top, there's four categories. You want to go to rescue recipes. And of course, the word rescue is the main word here. So let's say you have, I, I have a problem with celery always going to waste because it gets that little hula going on. It does the hula. I don't want to use it, but apparently we can. And here's uh, four recipes here that you can use. Celery, that's going to go to waste. Same thing with cheese. You can go to cheese. Really easy. So explore this website, Love Food, Hate Waste. With these new cages, even farmed fish will be able to travel the ocean. They were created by researchers at MIT by attaching two huge propellers to spherical cages 19 meters wide. The new fish homes could become an alternative to conventional cages which are anchored in one place. 
Large amounts of fish feces can become trapped under cages and damage the seafloor and marine life nearby. Since the swimming cages are designed to drift with water currents, they never sit in one place long enough to cause harm. And if they float too far off course, they can take control by powering up their own propellers. A small boat tethered above carries a diesel generator to power the motors. The researchers recently tested a prototype in Puerto Rico and found that it was easy to maneuver. The cage was able to propel itself at a steady rate of 0.3 meters per second. Hi, I'm Matt Dansko with Discovery News. We're here in New York City at the Science Barge to learn about sustainable urban agriculture. Sustainable urban agriculture is a way to grow food in the city, uh, either on buildings or in vacant lots and available space, to reduce uh, food transport into cities and really grow food where people live for a more carbon neutral, fresh, flavorful, uh, nutritious product. The Science Barge floats in the Hudson River in New York City and is the only working example of a sustainable urban farm in the area. Their mission is to not only grow food without damaging the environment around them, but also to educate people on the benefits of sustainability. Sustainability is really reducing the impact on the environment with choices you make. What you decide as a consumer to purchase as a food product, you're really voting with your food dollars of what you believe in. The sustainable pr uh, production methods that we're looking at are controlled environment agriculture. So we're looking at greenhouses coupled with recirculating hydroponic systems, powered by renewable energy sources and irrigated by rainwater collection. On the barge, these renewable energy systems consist of solar panels, wind generators, and a biodiesel generator. That energy is used to power pumps that help grow plants through water-based technologies, and it can even help grow fish. You won't, you can't really see them, but because the water has uh, all this compost tea in it, but we have tilapia in this tank, and so what we're doing is um, all the plant material that we have left over that we're not eating, we'll compost that and we compost it with worms and then those worms we feed to our fish. Our fish waste goes through a biological filter to convert some of the um, elements. Then that will go to feed our plants and then the plants will take up those nutrients to clean the water for the fish. So this is just a continuous cycle and then that lets us do produce fish and plants in the same space, still using controlled environment agriculture, but eliminating some of those other inputs that we're using, like fertilizers. To get water for these systems, we have uh, two ways. We get water from the rain and from the river. So these are our rainwater storage tanks. We have 1,200 gallons of storage capacity here. We get the rain from the greenhouse roof. The greenhouse is 1,300 square feet. So in a one inch rain event, we can collect about 800 gallons of water. And with the collection of this water that will be used and reused before being dumped back out into the environment without hazardous waste, the cycle of sustainability is complete. This type of sustainable farming works for the barge in New York, but Jen now can urge his people to think about the best sustainable process for their area. Sustainability is important for every decision that you make, and that decision that you do make is dependent on where you are and what is available to you. Have you ever wondered how far your food travels before it winds up on your plate? Well, if you live in one of the world's larger cities, your fresh vegetables or even pork may no longer come from a few states away, but may soon come from the 30-story building down the block. This is Columbia University professor Dixon de Palmier. De Palmier and his students have developed a concept called vertical farming that aims to grow crops and raise animals inside skyscrapers in city centers. A vertical farm, in our view, is a tall building, transparent, in an urban center that grows our food. The, the vertical farm of the future, which is a 30-story building, would be one which grew out of a, uh, a classroom project that I gave my students after we decided to farm indoors. So uh, I asked them how many stories high and how large a building would you have to build in order to feed 50,000 people a year. And they came back to me and said, it's 30 stories high, and it's a full city block, which is five acres of land. Through hydroponics, a solution-based method of growing crops without soil, and by decreasing the distance between producer and consumer, De Palmier believes vertical farming could significantly reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. He feels this would then, in turn, reduce food costs and lessen pollution. One-fifth of all the fossil fuels used in the United States is used for agriculture either to plow the fields, to harvest the crops, to store the crops, to refrigerate them or to ship them, or to process them further for value-added things like uh, high fructose corn syrup, etc. So fossil fuels plays a huge role in normal agriculture. 
It will not play any role whatsoever in urban vertical farming, none. The idea of vertical farming has spread far beyond Columbia University and has now caught the attention of people around the world. After a few failed prototypes, I finally came up with this, the Lifesaver bottle. Okay, now for the science bit. Before Lifesaver, the best hand filters were only capable of filtering down to about 200 nanometers. The smallest bacteria is about 200 nanometers. So a 200 nanometer bacteria is gonna get through a 200 nanometer hole. The smallest virus, on the other hand, is about 25 nanometers. So that's definitely going to get through those 200 nanometer holes. Lifesaver pores are 15 nanometers. So nothing's getting through. We've got some water from the River Cherwell and the River Thames that flow through here, and this is the water. But I got to thinking, you know, if we were in the middle of a flood zone in Bangladesh, the water wouldn't look like this. So I've gone and got some stuff to add into it. And this is from my pond. Have a smell of that, Mr. Cameraman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, we're just gonna pour that in there. <laughs> okay, we've got some uh, runoff from a sewage plant farm. So I'm just gonna put that in there. Put that in there, there we go. And some other bits and pieces. Chuck that in there. And uh, I've got a little gift here from a friend of mine's rabbit. So we're just gonna put that in there as well. <laughs> okay. Now, the Lifesaver bottle works really simply. You just scoop the water up. Today I'm gonna use a jug, just to show you all. Let's get a bit of that poo in there. That's not dirty enough. Let's just stir that up a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna take this really filthy water and put it in here. Do you want a drink yet? Okay, there we go. Replace the top. Give it a few pumps, okay? That's all that's necessary. 
Now, as soon as I pop the teat, sterile drinking water is going to come out. I've got to be quick. Are okay, you ready? There we go. Mind the electrics. That is safe, sterile drinking water. There you go, Chris. OK. Lifesaver bottle is used by thousands of people around the world. It lasts for 6,000 litres, and when it's expired using fail-safe technology, the system will shut off, protecting the user. Pop the cartridge out, pop a new one in, it's good for another 6,000 litres. So let's look at the applications. Traditionally, in a crisis, what do we do? We ship water. Then, after a few weeks, we set up camps. And people are forced to come into the camps to get their safe drinking water. What happens when 20,000 people congregate in a camp? Diseases spread. More resources are required. The problem just becomes self-perpetuating. But by thinking differently and shipping these, people can stay put. They can make their own sterile drinking water and start to get on with rebuilding their homes and their lives. Now, it doesn't require a natural disaster for this to work. Using the old thinking of national infrastructure and pipe work is too expensive. When you run the numbers on the calculator, you run out of noughts. So here's the thinking different bit. Instead of shipping water and using man-made processes to do it, let's use Mother Nature. She's got a fantastic system. She picks the water up from there, desalinates it for free, transports it over there and dumps it onto the mountains, rivers and streams. And where do people live? Near water. All we've got to do is make it sterile. And how do we do that? Well, we could use a lifesaver bottle or we could use one of these the same technology in a jerry can. This will process 25,000 litres of water. That's good enough for a family of four for three years. And how much does it cost? About half a cent a day to run. Thank you. So by thinking differently and processing water at the point of use, mothers and children no longer have to walk four hours a day to collect their water. They can get it from a source nearby. So with just eight billion dollars, we can hit the Millennium Goals target of halving the number of people without access to safe drinking water. To put that into context, the UK government spends about 12 billion pounds a year on foreign aid. But why stop there? With $20 billion, everyone can have access to safe drinking water. So the 3.5 billion people that suffer every year as a result, and the 2 million kids that die every year, will live. Back home, one of Australia's most vital resources is being created out of thin air. An Adelaide company is producing limitless quantities of drinking water using nothing but the air we breathe. This rather ordinary looking machine is turning the air we breathe into a precious resource that's fast running dry. Beautiful, tastes like water. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's just like, just like normal water. The most abundant source of water available on the planet right now is in the atmosphere. I mean, you see it fall as rain. What we do is we take that vapor that's available in the atmosphere, we condense it into drinking water, and you don't have to wait for the rain. Air is sucked in through the vents, filters purify it, moisture then condenses in this tank. It's treated with ozone and then filtered. Up to 20 litres a day is ready to drink. The larger industrial size can supply even more. That machine will make a thousand litres of water a day. It'll supply all your water needs for your entire house. The smaller version will initially cost around $1,600, then another $0.16 cents for every litre of water made. 
by adopting this kind of technology, we could have an endless supply of water. After all, it's all around us. It's in the air that we breathe. All we've got to do is capture it. And we're looking to build bigger and bigger units. I think it could be a, a huge part of the solution for the problem here in Australia. The sky water will be available within six months. With current technology, those who die of hunger do not die. They are killed. That's the truth. Water is already abundant on the planet and purifying it is just a problem of using technology, not even a problem of technology. Solutions through technology exist and could be applied starting yesterday, but the monetary system is limiting the technology to maintain the cycle of consumption. If, into an organization, created by some intelligent beings, the main concerns are not their necessities, then, the organization itself, must be the one to blame.